All right, good morning, everybody. As you can tell, we're in a different location. We've been playing musical buildings here, haven't we? It's been fun, though. It, as long as I got a place to teach and preach, I'm happy. Amen. But it uh, looks like this will be our new home for a while, and this will be great. We'll be able to be here and study and a lot of chairs. I like that you have little, almost like a desk, so you can take notes better. Amen. So that'll be good. So we're going to start today on the history of the church, part eight. And we're going to be talking about the Bible texts. And did you know there's the true line of Bible text? And then there's a corrupted line of Bible text. And I'm going to prove that to you from the Bible. I'm going to show you in the Bible that even in the time of Paul, they have been changing the Word of God. So you can have a true Bible or you can have a messed with Bible. Which would you rather have? Um, it's kind of like, you know, before we got married, Laura and I, we would write love letters to each other. Well, I wanted her words because I love her. If someone would have taken that love letter and said, well, that's great, Brother Breaker, but I think it should say this. And they changed it first and crossed out some stuff and then let me read it. I would be rather angry. You know why? Those aren't all her words. Those are what you think she should have said. Well, someone said that the Bible is God's love letter to us. Should we let people change it, take things out, mess with it? A lot of your new versions of the Bible, I get this question all the time. How come my Bible's missing verses? How come there's words that are in your Bible that aren't in my Bible. Right. How come my Bible takes out whole sentences? Well, there's a reason for that. And what we're going to do today, this is going to be part eight, and this is going to be the end of our study on church history, and this is going to tie it all together. Do you remember what we studied? How that there's the true church, and then there's the false church? Mm -hmm. Well, the false church has a false Bible. Yeah. They've got a Bible that they've messed with and changed some things. And with that false Bible, they got the reformers to come back in that left. Those Protestants are now going back. And so I put that line all the way out in the tribulation because they missed the rapture if they're not saved. <laughs> See how I did that? So what I want to show you today, and I want to do it in the spirit of humbleness and meekness and kindness and love. All right, it's very easy to get angry when you see people messing with the Bible. You know why? Is it Psalms 138 verse 2 where it says that God magnified his word above his very name? That's how important the Bible is. You can't get saved without a Bible. So don't mess with Texas and don't mess with the Bible. Amen? That's the way I look at it. So let's start with Luke chapter 11 and verse 28. Luke 11, 28. And I'm going to do my best to show you. I don't know if that came in on the camera, but this, this is just full of things that I'll be showing you today. And if you can zoom out, if that does show up, I don't know. But I'll be showing you different things. And I'm going to preach it right today. Because remember what the Bible teaches that in the last days of the church, there's going to be what? Apostasy. Right. And do you remember what apostasy means? It means a falling away. Yeah. Yeah. And there are a lot of Bible colleges, I hate to say it, in the world that are teaching it wrong yeah. when it comes to the Bible. A lot of colleges you go to, they make fun of our King James Bible right. and laugh at it because they've been indoctrinated into accepting the false text, yeah. the corrupted text, rather than the true text. Yeah. So uh, when you talk about this, though, people get emotional. So I'm not here to, I'm trying not to be emotional. I want the facts, you know, isn't that what? Dragnet, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. So we're going to stick with the facts today, amen? And I'm going to do my best to do that. So Luke 11, 28, and give you as much scripture as we can. Luke 11, 28. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God. Now watch this and keep it. Yes, that's right. Get the Bible and keep the Bible. Yes. I want the word of God, every word of God. Mm -hmm. I don't want a watered down version or a perversion that takes out words. Right. Now, a lot of this, I've had to do this study for Spanish as well. So I've got a teaching all about this in Spanish. I've done a lot of study about this. And where do we get our Bible from? Do you keep the Word of God? Well, we see this false line over here, the false church, which, by the way, is connected with Rome. And we will see that here a little bit later because I drew a map out for you to look at. We're going to look at the map. But that false church in Rome corrupted a lot of things in the Bible. And because they did that, now they were able to make their own doctrine. And that church's doctrine doesn't line up with our doctrine. So how can we, through ecumenicalism, unite with that church if they've got a different Bible and a different doctrine? I don't see how we can. So this verse here says we're supposed to keep the Word of God. And what will we get if we keep it? A blessing. Y'all yeah. want to be blessed? <laughs> sure. All right, then let's don't throw out our Bible. Let's stick with the Bible. Now, the question is, well, which Bible's the right one? There's over 200 different Bibles in English. Yes. 
I don't understand that. Do you? In Spanish, there's one translation of Shakespeare. <laughs> they just translate it. Why are there 200? Do you understand that? Well, I understand it because I've studied it and I see what they have is called the critical text. So we'll get into that. We've got a lot to get into today. But I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and then 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The devil hates God. Would you all agree with that? So anytime that God is a working, the devil is going to try to stop it and corrupt it and mess it up. And so do you think the devil just sat by and watched God give the world his word and didn't do anything? No, the devil said, I got to stop that. Mm -hmm. And so he's immediately, almost immediately, as soon as the Bible was, was written, he came in and started changing it. And we read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians 4, 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Would you agree it's dishonest to change the Bible? And it says, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That's what I'd like to do today. Present the truth and ask you to search your conscience and see if what I'm telling you today is the truth. Because there are some dishonest people out there walking in craftiness that are trying to do what? Handle the word of God deceitfully. They're deceitful. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2.17 we read these words. Paul says this. Now notice what Paul says. For we are not as many. Whoa, get that for a minute. There's a lot of them. Many means a lot. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Yeah. That's about 60 AD. And he says there's a lot of people already out there changing the Bible right. as soon as it came out. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And that's my desire today is speak the word, speak the truth, speak in Christ, show you all this. And then you can decide for yourself which Bible you want to use. As for me and my house, well, we've already made up our minds which one's the true Word of God. I'm just going to show you why. We are warned in the Bible itself not to change the Bible. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. We've got two verses in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. And oddly enough, the first one's in the beginning of the Bible. The next one's in the middle of the Bible. The last one's in the end of the Bible. So beginning, ending, and middle, God says, don't mess with this book. Just don't do it. <laughs> Amen. Now, who was the ones that were, were messing with it? The Gnostics. Yes. Now, what does it mean to be a Gnostic? Well, that comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. Mm -hmm. They were those that came along and said, well, I, I know more than you do. Mm -hmm. And because I know what you don't know, then I'm right. And you know what? You should be banned because, you know, you're false information. You know, you're not. No, only I have the truth and you don't. So you shouldn't even be allowed to speak. That's what they were like in the time of Paul. Things haven't changed much in the last 2000 years, have they? So where do we get our knowledge and truth from? The Bible. They got theirs from philosophy. And uh, maybe have time to go into that, maybe not. Deuteronomy 4.2, let's read the word of God. First warning not to mess with this book. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So God tells the Jews, don't add and don't diminish, don't subtract anything from this book. Now let's go to the middle of the Bible, very middle of the Bible, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5, look what it says here, and I'm probably going to have to read verse 6 too. So Proverbs 30 verse 5 and 6. Every word of God is what? Pure. Pure. Now remember that. We're going to look at that here in a minute. Mm -hmm. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. And how do we trust Him? Well, we know He can't lie. That's right. So that's why I trust Him. He's the only person right. in the world or the universe that can't lie to me. So I'm going to trust Him and trust His word. And then it says there in uh, verse 6, Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Right. Hmm. Interesting. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19, we see the final, uh, well, I'm going to call it a command of God not to mess with the book. Right. Don't mess with God's word. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. Mm -hmm. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Well, I don't want any more plagues. We've got enough of those, huh? And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Wow, that's heavy, isn't it? You think God's saying, hey, don't mess with my book. 
Yeah, three times, you know, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses will let every word be established. So God says, hey, don't mess with the Bible. Don't mess with God's words. Don't change them. Psalms 119, 140 says toward the end of the verse, thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Amen. I love the Bible because it's pure. Yeah. Titus 1, 2 tells us that God, which cannot lie, or God that cannot lie. So God can't lie. So if I have his word, I can put my complete faith and trust in what it says. Yes. And I can hold this book up and I could say, thus saith the Lord. Right. You know how many times the Old Testament prophets said that? Because they spoke what God told them to speak. Yeah. So if I hold this in my hand, I can say, I have the very words of God, the truth, and thus saith the Lord. And this is the authority in all yeah. matters of faith and practice because it is viewed as absolute truth. Amen. Right. But only if it's a certain version <laughs> in English, because there's other versions that have been messed with. Yeah. So now I've got to go to 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I look into the, all this to find out which Bible is the right Bible in English. Otherwise, I'm going to be ashamed. I don't want to be ashamed. So God's word is truth. We all got that settled. All right. John 17.17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Yes absolute truth and it comes from God. Just let me show you another verse on that. 1 Thessalonians 2 13. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. I just this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Because so many people today guess what they say? Man wrote that book. <laughs> oh really? So it's a book written by men. Wow. And yet they all seem to agree. How is that possible? You ever met men that agree all the time together? Not me. Must have been God was writing through them. A lot of people today say, well, men were inspired to write the book, so it's really the inspired words of men. That's not what my Bible says. Right. It says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You know, new versions change that, by the way. So who inspired the word? God. And he spoke his inspired word through them. So it's not their inspired word. It's his inspired word. It's like if you sit down and write a book, um, when you're done with that book, while you're writing it on your computer, do you write on there, written by, I don't know, Dell Computer? <laughs> written by Hewlett Packard? No, you put your name because you're the author. That's just the tool that you used. Right. The men were the tool that God used to speak His Word. Good, Don't forget that, okay? Yeah. That is important. So this isn't just a book written by man. This is God's yeah. Word. Yeah. First Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the Word of men. <laughs> All these people, it's just a book written by men. No, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, there it is, the truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Yeah, so that's why the Bible is so important. It is God's words Amen. and it is powerful. Do you know how powerful God's words are? You just go to the first chapter. All God has to do is speak and it happens. Right. It's that powerful. Let it be. Boom. And it is. Now that's a powerful word. Amen. So you don't mess with that word. But yet today we see a lot of people who are apostates that have messed with the word. Now we have 200 different versions in English. Plus, the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. So why are so many Christians today confused over which Bible is the right Bible? Must be the devil's behind it. Well, no, no, this one's good, and it's all a matter of preference. Well, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. But first of all, we've got to talk about two things. We've got to talk about inspiration and preservation. Right. All right. God's word is inspired. Don't turn there. But second Timothy 316 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Again, it's God inspiring his word, not man. Man didn't write the book. They were just the tool that wrote down God's words. Right. You know, oftentimes they spoke and someone was writing down what they were speaking. So it was the Holy Ghost speaking through them. So God inspired his word. Now, what good is it if God inspired his word and then we lost it? Wouldn't that be awful? Go to Psalms chapter 12 and verse 6 and 7. So somewhere out there existed at one time God's word. whoop de doo How good is that if we don't have it? Well, we should all be, you know, oh, I wish I was those people because they got it and we don't have it. Do we have it? Yes. You cannot have inspiration yeah. without preservation. Right. Right. If he inspired his word, it was for a purpose for us to read. And so he must preserve it for us to read. Amen. Otherwise, how do we read it? We get in a time machine. We go back in the way back machine with Mr. Peabody or something and, and go back there and try to find that. We, we can't do that. No. 
So he must have preserved it. And that's what the Bible says. And by the way, if you have a King James, you see that new versions change this. That's why I keep going. Watch out for look at what it says in Psalms 12, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. By the way, seven different languages it went through before it came to the King James. And you know, King James is the seventh in English. Yes. Because you had the Bishop's Bible, the Matthew's Bible, the Geneva Bible. And then it, what's with that number seven? Brother Mike knows what's about that number seven. But it says purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Yeah. So we have a promise that God will preserve his word. Yeah. And I believe he has done that today. So if God's word is preserved, then where is it? You get that all the time. Well, where was the Bible before the King James? Oh, it was there. It was there. And the King James found it and put it into English. So it's always existed. He had to have preserved it. Had to. And so it's all about salvation, sanctification, and the scriptures. So you have the true word of God, right, being preserved. Right. So what will we call that here? We'll call that the pure preserved Bible or the pure Bible. And it's the pure Bible that God preserved. Yes. Do you believe in preservation? I do. Yes, so God must have preserved his word. And I thank God that he did. Yes. So we look at that, and if God's Word is preserved, then where is it? We must look at history and the manuscripts that it came from and the copies of those, and we've got to figure it out. So let's turn over there to Romans chapter 3, and this is where Laura's not going to like this too much, but i got to do it. i got to do it. We're going to look at the Old Testament, and we're going to look at the New Testament. Here we go. Laura doesn't like this. Now, I'm not going to draw pornography, so I'm going to make this as... Simple as I can, and you're perverted if you get turned on by what I'm about to draw up here. But the Bible says in 1 Peter 2.2 2, that we are to desire the pure milk of the Word. Yeah. Where does milk come from? In Spanish, chichis. <laughs> from breasts. All right. Now we have two. Animals have, what, six or eight or something? I don't know. So the Old Testament and the New Testament, the pure Word of God. All right. Here's the pure Bible. It's amazing. We have two breasts. A woman does. So that would correspond with the Old Testament, New Testament. So uh, let's put this here. Here's the Old Testament. Here's the New Testament. All right. I know, but I'm just making a life lesson out of something that's real. OK, <laughs> so here we've got the pure Bible. Now we're going to look at what I call the corrupt Bible. Maybe we should call it the perverted Bible. Let's do that. Let's let's go to perverted Bible. Because, uh, well, we'll get to that. But you've got the Old Testament and New Testament. So it's like milk. It just so happens a woman has two. <laughs> and you can go to either one. Well, it's like milk, Old Testament, New Testament. Does that make sense? That's pretty interesting, isn't it? And we're going to look at this, but go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 1. So Romans chapter 3 and verse 1. Nobody's, you know, I can just hear it. Breaker is writing pornography on the board. No, I'm just making a lesson. <laughs> Whatever, man, a doctor would understand, okay? Uh, so Romans chapter 3 and verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Verse 1. Now look at verse uh, 2. Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. What is an oracle? The oracle is the scriptures. Yes. So God gave the scriptures to the Jews. Right. All right, so if I want to find the pure word of God and where it came from, what language would I go to? Well, I'm going to go to Hebrew. And if I go to Hebrew, I find the Hebrew text that has been the most copied and most preserved and the best text is what we call the Hebrew Masoretic text. And the Masoretic text is a text that was done by the Levitical priests. They were called Masorites and they lived in Jerusalem. So here's Jerusalem. So this is where we're looking for the Old Testament would be right here because that's where God put them in their land. So I'm going there and I'm looking in their language, Hebrew, and I'm going to say, where is the Old Testament Bible? And so I'd look for Hebrew, would I not? And I have here on the table the Hebrew Masoretic text someplace. Here we go. And uh, there it is. So if you want to read in Hebrew, the Hebrew Masoretic text, Help yourself. We call it the Hebrew um, Ben Chaim text is what it's called. So they lived in Israel and the Masoretes or Masoretes were priests who copied it. And it's known as the Masoretic text of Ben Chaim. Now they had rules in copying the Bible. They would copy the Bible 
and they would count the letters on each page. And if there were more than two mistakes, they would burn that and tell them, go start over. That's the rules for copying that because they didn't want any error to seep in. And so they had a lot of rules. A matter of fact, they were so reverent that whenever they came to the word of the Lord, they would stop and go wash their hands and then come back because they didn't want to copy his name with dirty hands. That's where that came from. So that's where our King James comes from in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Masoretic text. So uh, that's pure text of the Old Testament. Now, oh, there's so many things to get into here. But this is where we would look for the Old Testament, right? Well, today, all your new versions of the Bible, they go, no, we don't like that one. So they go over here to a place called Alexandria, Egypt, and they get what they call the LXX. And they say, now that's what we want. But that was written in Greek. Now let me tell you about this LXX. I, I'm going to put it over here. Uh-oh, better not put triple X. It's LXX. But you got to watch out. When I give you the names of these different texts, there's some weird words within those names. I'm just going to point that out and let you figure it out. But I've got a book here, and sometimes you find stuff in Spanish that's not in English, and English is not in Spanish. And this book talks about, oh, 100, 200, 300 years after Jesus, there were the two first Bible schools, if you will, so-called Christian Bible schools. There was the school of Antioch, and there was the school of Alexandria. And the school of Antioch, this book says, is where Christians went, and they believed that you literally take every word of God as written, and you believe it. This school was the liberal school, the school of Alexandria. And it had been influenced a lot by these... Um, Gnostics and by secular humanism, matter of fact, by Greek philosophy. Yeah. And so there were some Greek Bibles that had been translated from Hebrew, but they were full of errors. There were a lot of mistakes in them. If you get a chance, go to Acts chapter 11, verse 26, and, uh, or just write it down for sake of time. But it says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch of Syria. Right. So they went from Jerusalem to Antioch. So if I want to find a Bible, I want to go to the fountain where the Christians were. I'm going to go here. I'm not going to go over here, which historically has been liberal philosophers. You know what I'm saying? Right. But today, most people go, no, no, no. You need a Bible from the LXX. <laughs> it's like, why don't I go over here to where the true word came from? Why do I need to go over there? Um, in the Bible, it connects Alexandria with guess who? Rome. Acts 28 11. Rome is where all the problems came from. Those are the ones persecuting true Christians. And true Christians seem to be over here. So if you look at a map, it's just so easy to help get all this together. So the LXX, what is the LXX? Well, first of all, Alexandria, Egypt is the center of secular humanism and philosophy. And we are warned in Colossians 2 8 to watch out for philosophy and traditions of men. Remember, they were ones that brought in tradition rather than the Bible. Alexandria is steeped in Greek philosophy and Gnosticism. Now, I don't have time to go back to it, but they had a school which they taught philosophy, and you can trace modern Greek philosophy all the way back to a man named Socrates. <laughs> no, that's not how you say it. Socrates. And Socrates was one of the... I, I want to be nice, but I guess he'd been dead for over 2,000 years, so it's okay. One of the dumbest fellows that ever lived because he never taught anything. All he did was go around and question everything. Now, who was the first person in the Bible to question something? Genesis chapter 3. Yea, hath God said. That's the modern school of thought is, well, I don't know about that. Doubt. Well, the Bible says faith. Yep. So here's your center of faith. Here's your center of doubt. Mm -hmm. And so the LXX is a translation that they, most of your people today say, well, it's, it's a, from 150 to 100 B.C. And they say there's this letter of Aristias, Aristias, I can't even say his name. I'm thinking in Spanish. Aristides or something, and they claim that the LXX was a translation done by two of each tribe of Israel that came down from Jerusalem and came over here, and they all worked together to do a translation into Greek. Now, how do we know that just cannot be true? Because God gave to the Levitical priest the Bible, yeah. not the 12 tribes. Right. And it's called the LXX. You do the math, that should be 72. LXX is 70. Where'd the other two ones go? <laughs> You're missing two there, buddy. Maybe they just didn't make the bus or something. I don't know. But So they say the LXX is the Greek New Testament that everyone used in the time of Jesus. They even say that Jesus used the Greek LXX. Wow. Do you think? And by the way, it's called the Septuagint. Right. Mm -hmm. Septuagint. 
When I see that word, I'm sorry, I just think septic tank. That's the yeah. first thought I have when I see sept, sept, septic, you know, something's bad. Is the Septuagint a good translation? This fella says no. This is the first Bible translated into Spanish, the first whole Bible. And in the very beginning, beginning of this, he was a Roman Catholic, and he got out of Catholicism, and he says in this Bible, let me read it to you, he says this about the LXX. First, we declare that we have not followed completely or in all the old Latin translation, which is the Vulgate, that is in common use for, use, for although its ancient authority is mighty, neither one or the other should excuse the many errors that it has. Yep. And uh, he's talking about the Vulgate. I'll get to that here in a minute. But the, this all ties in with the LXX yep. too. So the, uh, the Septuagint is full of errors and mistakes. And yet modern scholars say, no, 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 you need a translation from that. Get away from your King James that goes to the Hebrew. No, you need this one. Let me just give you a couple of examples. But Well, before I do... Did God tell the Jews to go to Egypt? If you want to write these down, Jeremiah 42, 18 to 19. God says, don't go to Egypt. Right. Deuteronomy 17, 18. Deuteronomy 31, 24 to 26. Ezra 7, 6 and 11 and 12. God says, don't go there. <laughs> so if that was a true story, they rebelled against God, didn't they? And did the opposite of what God said. Right. And they're not supposed to go to the heathen and translate into another... No, we stick with their language and their text is what we're supposed to. So the LXX has many problems, errors and mistakes. For example, it has the first 10 patriarchs 100 years later than they actually lived. It changes things and messes with history. It has Methuselah. We know about that because we've been studying that in Genesis. It has Methuselah living 14 years after the flood of Noah. Well, what did he do? Did he just sit around and lay on his back and float until it was all over? And hey Noah, Noah's like, I wish you could have come in the ark. Well, it's okay, I'm still good. I mean, what on earth is? And you start studying this, you see error after error after error. No, Methuselah died because his name means at his death it shall come. So that's a very corrupt translation. In Exodus 20, it takes the sixth commandment and changes it to the eighth commandment. So whoever did this translation, by the way, his name was Origen, is what it appears. He changed a lot of things. The LXX has 2,700 words less than the Hebrew text and is an eighth shorter. In Proverbs 15:27, the LXX says this, One can only have his sins purged by giving alms and doing good. What does that sound like to you? Works! <laughs> a works gospel. Are we saved by works? No, but that made tradition. It said we're saved by works. True Christians know we're saved by faith. So do you see who's behind the changing of the Bible? It's this crowd connected with this crowd. Because yep. like I told you, in the Bible, there's three verses that connects Rome with Alexandria. Yep. So we don't go to Egypt and that area to find the Bible. We go to the source. Amen. But almost everyone in the world today that claims to be a Bible scholar, they reject that yep. and they go to this. The one that has errors and mistakes. Well, what is that? Why is that? Now, I don't have time to get into the Haxapala and Origen, but Origen is probably the one that, that made the Septuagint. They had a Bible that was six different columns of, of translation works of different ones. Origen was a character, man. Yeah. Origen did not rightly divide. Nope. The Bible says if your right hand offend thee, cut it off. He had problems thinking about girls. I guess he was on the internet looking at pornography. Wait, no, that didn't exist back then. So, well, anyway, and you know what he did? Snip, snip. Yep. He castrated himself he because he saw that verse and said, well, then I won't think about women anymore. That's disgusting, man. But that's what he did. Yep. And you know what he did to the Bible? He castrated the Bible, too. Because right. he started cutting stuff out of our book. Yep. So I don't go by the LXX. I think it's got errors and mistakes. But all over the internet, if you look up LXX, they all praise it and say, no, this was the Bible Jesus would have used. Mm -hmm. No, Jesus spoke Hebrew. I don't think he would have used a corrupt Bible. Right. So now to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, it was written in Koine Greek. That just means the language of the common people. Yep. And we got our King James Bible from what we call the Texas Receptus. Right. And the Texas Receptus is Latin for the received text. Yep. And it's also known today as the majority text. Yes. Why? Because there are over 5,309 manuscripts of the New Testament right. that were found. Yes. And those all agree with each other over 95% of the time. And they all were found around here. Gee, that's really close to here, isn't it? Where the early Christians were. Well, that's called the Byzantine Empire. 
and that's called the Byzantine text. And so there's 5,000 plus manuscripts of Greek, and this is what they took for the New Testament for our blessed King James Bible. Now, is that where new versions come from? No. Not at all. Unfortunately, no, that's not where new versions come from. Um, but let me continue here. Erasmus, one of the reformers, he was reading the Latin Vulgate. And I wanted to say that about this thing here, that when he was talking, he was talking about the Vulgate and the many errors that the Latin Vulgate has. And he even continues there. He says, the many errors it has, departing so many innumerable times from the truth of the Hebrew text, others adding, other transposing from one place to another, all of which, though, could well be prevented, it cannot be denied. So 1569, one of the reformers says, the Latin Vulgate is corrupt. Now, what is the Latin Vulgate? Well, the Latin Vulgate is a work of Jerome. Yep. And this fellow named Jerome, who lived, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I'll get there eventually. Jerome lived close to 400 years after Jesus. Right. And he went around, and he went over here and got some texts, and then he came over here and got a bunch of texts. Mm -hmm. And then he went back up here, and he translated what's called the Latin Vulgate. Now, what do you think when you see Vulgate? I always think of vulgar. <laughs> That's the first thing I think. <laughs> but he translated the Latin Vulgate into Latin, and the Catholic Church says that's our official Bible. And these people that read it, like him, he said, that's full of errors and mistakes. So is that the Bible we should accept? Yet all new versions of the Bible come from texts that are Alexandrian texts, and that has Alexandrian corruptions in it. So I'm not interested in the Vulgate, thank you very much, no thanks. So our King James Bible comes from over 5,000 manuscripts that come from the place to where it should come from, yeah. Antioch, in that area. So what happened? Well, let me show you the Texas Receptus here. Here's the uh, Texas Receptus for anybody that wants to come look at it and read the Greek. <laughs> You'll say, it's Greek to me. Well, I actually had three years of Greek and... Yeah, I tried to forget it. But anyway, um, same thing with, with Hebrew. I had a year of Hebrew, and it looks like chicken scratch, you know? You go out and look in the chicken pen, it looks like, oh, they wrote a word, you know? But um, that's what it looks like. So you got to be careful. But you can learn all that if you want, but make sure you look at the right text, the Masoretic text and the Texas Receptus. Well, the devil just couldn't accept that. So the devil came along, and he said, you know, I, I don't like that. And the devil allowed Jerome to change, and he was one of these in the false text, to give a false Bible full of errors and mistakes. And he introduced the uh, Apocrypha. And so a lot of the traditions of the Catholic Church come from that Bible. Yeah. And that Bible comes from Egypt. Do you know the Bible has nothing good to say about Egypt? Mm -hmm. All throughout the Bible, they've always been the ones against God. Right. And you want me to believe that we're supposed to go there for our Bible? <laughs> no, I'm going over here for my Old Testament. I'm going over here for my New Testament because that's where the Bible says this is where the fountain came from. Right. So I'm a Texas Receptus person, but I'm a King James person because it's King James came from the Texas Receptus. So you've got to watch out for these new versions of the Bible. Well, then we got our Bible in 1611, and everybody agreed, yeah, Texas Receptus is the right one. Erasmus would go over to Byzantine and get those Greek texts, and he would go, man, this says it right, and the Vulgate says it wrong. <laughs> so he's like, man, I'm, I'm starting to see the corruption. Guess who's the one behind all the corruption? Rome. Yeah. And we've seen in our study, is it Rome that we're supposed to go to? Or is it Rome that killed Jesus and the early apostles and has persecuted true Christians throughout history? And yet we're supposed to ask them for the Bible? Uh-uh, I don't think so. So, 1611, all was good. All is good, right? 1611, we got our King James Bible and everyone's like, yay, we got the Word of God translated into English after the time of the Reformation and Enlightenment. Everything's good. But there were people out there that, that hated the King James Bible. And there were people out there that were like, oh, man, I want, to, I want to get back to that Latin Vulgate. And so what this church tried to do after that is say, let's see what we can do to try to get people back to our Bible. Because our Bible teaches our tradition and their Bible teaches the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, hey, for a little light on your lie over there. And the world started to wake up and the Reformation said, hey, they're, they're, they're trying to snow us. <laughs> they're trying to give us a lie. So they found a couple of manuscripts, which, by the way, are Alexandrian manuscripts. And they began to say, hey, I think these are the older and better manuscripts. And they found one, and I'll, I'll put them up here. They found one called Sinaiticus. And the Sinaiticus, I call it Sinaiticus, or Aleph, was found in 1844 by Constantine von Tischendorf. 
Tischendorf. And look at the word that's in it. And look at the other word that's in it. <laughs> Is it good to cuss? <laughs> but anyway, um, and he found this, and guess where he found it? He found it over here, what they call Mount Sinai. Now, I believe Mount Sinai is a different place, but there's a monastery down here. And he went down to that monastery looking for old Bible text. And he found the Sinaiticus in the garbage can mm -hmm. in a monastery in that area, a Catholic monastery. Why was it in the garbage can? Because the Catholic priests go, well, there's so many errors and mistakes now, we figure it's no good. Right. And so he's like, oh, I'm going to rescue it. And, and he says, now, this is the true Bible. And so he wants us to believe that Ours is the one with the errors and mistakes, and that's the oldest one, so that one's the better one. That's not how it works, but that's the old switcheroo that they tried to do. And so it was found in a trash can in a Catholic monastery in what they call Mount Sinai. The monks saw that it had so many errors in the text that they were throwing it away. They claim this is a 4th century manuscript. They say it goes back to 400 after Jesus. Now, there's a lot of controversy about that, and there's a lot of cool videos on YouTube about that, how it might have been a forgery. Now, there's another one that they use today called the Vaticanus. Uh-oh. <laughs> is a vat a good thing? What do you keep in a vat? Poison? Alcohol? Well, isn't alcohol poison? I mean, anyway, I got a book called Alcohol, The Delightful Poison. And should I even... <laughs> that's in the Word, too. <laughs> hmm. I'm just, it's interesting how God puts in words, other words, that kind of point to whether it's good or bad. I don't know. So the Vaticanus, or B, was found around 1481 in the Vatican in Rome by Napoleon. It contains the New Testament only up to Hebrews 9.14. From then on, it's not even in it. Hmm. So it's not a, a whole manuscript. Now, you take these two manuscripts, and between uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and these two, there's over 3,000 changes. That's a lot of corruption, isn't it? 3,000 3, changes. I wouldn't trust those manuscripts for anything in the world. But they're from Alexandria. And that's where this Vulgate, so the Catholic Church says, oh yeah, we want those. And they got into the business of translating the Bible, and that's where you get your 200 different versions from. Right. They're all trying to get you back to that manuscript, so they'll get you back to Rome. Yeah. That's the goal, folks. Right. I'm going to prove that to you here in a second. So, there was also one called the Codex Alexandrius. Of course, that would come from here, and it was um, acquired by King Carlos I or whatever and, uh, in about 1627. These were used by two men named Westcott and Hort. Yeah. And Westcott and Hort took the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. And old Westcott and Hort, here's your perverted text, um, we'll write here, I'll just put Alexandrian. The Alexandrian manuscripts, which we know are the Vat and the Sin. I'll just uh, abbreviate. <laughs> and uh, so these guys, Westcott and Hort. Yeah. Now, do you know Westcott and Hort? You ever heard of them? Oh, yeah. You go to many so-called Christian Bible schools and they praise those men. Yeah. They were such godly scholars and so great men. No. Gail Ripplinger's book. Hazardous materials. On the back is a picture of Westcott and Hort dressed like ladies. Your first transgenders. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I guess they'd be gladly accepted today. Yep. <laughs> Makes me wonder a guy if he's not cross-dressing when he's, you know. But anyway, um, so yeah, they're great folks, aren't they? Well, actually, no, no. They were closet Catholics. Yep. They loved the worship of Mary. They were cross-dressers. They were liberals. They practiced what's called communion with the saints. There was the high church, Anglican Church of England, and the low church. You know what communion of the saints is? You would go into the church building at night, in the middle of the night with all the lights off, and you would pray. And you wouldn't leave until they spoke back to you. Mm. That's creepy, isn't it? Who do you think speaking? Well, the Bible says in the last days they'll be seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So I'm not a fan of Westcott and Hort. They started what they called the Ghostly Guild. You know what the Ghostly Guild is? Do you ever watch that TV show where the guys go around looking for ghosts, ghost hunters, and it's all in green because they're at night? That traces its root back to what these guys started, looking for ghosts. What do you think ghosts are? I firmly believe that ghosts are just devils and demons. So these guys are looking for demons and talking to them. Creepy! But you go to your Bible school, no, they're a great men of God. And you're just like, dude, do you know how to study? So in 1888, Westcott, or excuse me, 1881, Westcott and Hart put out what they call their own Greek text. And guess what it's called? It's called the critical, <laughs> critical Greek New Testament. <laughs> is it okay to be critical of the Word of God? <laughs> you're a critic, is what you are, and you're criticizing the true Word of God.
But they're, oh man, I left the book at home that they wrote. I have their book. They wrote a book saying, we believe the older texts are better. So we believe that these are the older texts, so they're better. Yet they're the ones with the most changes and the most errors. So they wrote a book about that and they got the so-called scholarly world to follow them. Now, when they got their Bible out in 1881, their New Testament, they took it to the Queen of England. And the story goes that they wanted her to accept it. Because we have the authorized King James Bible. Right. Because he authorized this version. They were hoping the Queen will authorize our translation and we can get everybody to follow our Bible rather than the King James Bible. They hated the Texas Receptus. So it was Queen, was it Queen Victoria at the time? I believe it was Victoria. And so... They're there waiting, and the, and the queen comes in, and, and they've got their little New Testament Greek text. And the chaplain was there with the queen. Now, I don't know all that was said there, but the story goes that the chaplain just came over, whispered in the ear of the queen, and walked away. And the queen looked at those two men and their New Testament, and she turned the back on them and walked away. Yeah. The queen of England would not even accept their Bible <laughs> because it was so full of errors and mistakes. Now, here I have what's called the Doctored New Testament by D.A. Waite. And what he does is he puts the King James Bible and every time their text changed something, he wrote it here in bold. Every single page yeah. they had to go through and change something in the Bible. Why? Because they didn't believe it. And you're going to accept that? I don't accept new versions of the Bible. Well, they say, well, no new version of the Bible changes any doctrine. That is not true. That is not true. If we have time, we'll get into that as well. But they helped what's called modern textual criticism. And they helped start the modern textual criticism movement today, which is the work of the Nessel Allen text. So the people that took over their work of textual criticism were Nessel Allen. Now, I went to Bible school and I learned Greek. Okay? I have the Nessel Allen text right here. 26th edition. <laughs> I think it's like in the 28th now. So it's changing. It's a changing text because they go, we don't even know what God said. We're to keep changing it because we think it ought to say this. Well, if you think it should say this and he thinks it should say that, now we have conflicting authorities, don't we? If we have a Bible that's settled and preserved, we don't have any conflicting authorities. Can I read to you what they said about this? By the way, every new version of the Bible comes from this rather than what the King James came from. The corrupted, changed Bible. So if you don't have a King James Bible and you have a different version, you, you have a perversion. You have a Bible that someone changed something. And it's not what God said. It's what they think God should have said. That's what it all boils down to. Let me read you the beginning of the Nestle Allen text here. And you tell me if you want to hold this up and say this is the word of God. Because most Bible schools in America teach that this is the right text and your Bible comes from this then we have a problem. This is based on the text and the great work of the textual critics of the 19th century, Tischendorf, Westcott, and Hort. It says, The text shared by these two editions was adopted internationally by Bible societies and following an agreement between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies, it has served as the basis for new translations and for revisions made under their supervision. If you have a new version of the Bible, they translate it from this because they want to get you back to this. They want to get you back to Rome. Now that's not all. Look what it says here about this. Are you ready? I, I want you to see. I'm going to leave it open up here. You can read it for yourself. It says about this version, it is not to be considered as definitive. It is not the true word of God. It's the best we think God maybe might have said somehow, maybe possibly. And it's always changing, so we don't know because we're the final authority, and you aren't. So God didn't preserve his word. And it continues, is not considered to be as definitive, but as a stimulus to further efforts toward defining and verifying the text of the New Testament. So it's always going to be in a state of change. This is what, the something edition, 26th edition, I don't know, probably 30th edition now. And who's behind all this? The Roman Catholic Church. They are putting all this out. I'll leave this here if you want to look at that. So you look at this, and by the way, here's the Latin Vulgate, okay? I've got all these here, this all in Latin. Here's a, um, they'll never, they never stop correcting God's Word. Here's an Old Testament in Hebrew called the Kittle Old Testament. Kittle was a German. And he says, I don't think the Masoretic text's good. I'm, and he found another manuscript, and he says, I think it ought to. So he took textual criticism into the Old Testament. And guess what? 
He was a German. Did God give the Bible to the Germans? We go to the Nazis, do we, and ask them what the Bible should say? I don't think that works too well because they were anti-Jewish, weren't they? Um, no. When you start studying this, you find that the modern uh, so-called Bible scholars are a bunch of liars. And guess what? One of them's name is Ehrman. <laughs> you do therefore greatly err, and his name is Err Man. <laughs> I just find that so funny, don't you? Anyway, so I want to get the true Word of God. I want to get the right Bible. And um, all new versions are translated from the corrupted text, which isn't even finished and is continually changing. Mm -hmm. Who's behind all this? Rome. I want you to know, and I'm just going to say this, that the critical text is the Catholic text. Right. And that's the goal of all new t translations, is to get you back to Rome. Yep. And this woman, Gail Ripplinger, wrote New Age Bible Versions, mm -hmm. and she shows you how it does affect doctrine yep. and how it does change and how the true Bible is the King James and all new versions have a goal to get people back to that church and even to the New Age. And she shows how the New Age is merging. And you know the Catholic Church is now into New Age stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So new versions are going to get you back to Rome. Let's stick with the King James Bible. Man, I've got so many things up here. I don't know where to go next. There's so many things I wanted to show. And it, they say new versions of the Bible don't affect doctrine. Yeah, they do. Acts 8.37 is taken out of new versions of the Bible. If you take out the whole verse, Acts 8.37, then it says someone's saved by water baptism. If you put it in like it's supposed to be in, it says, uh, he said, I believe with all my heart. Then they baptized him. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, God is manifest in the flesh. They change it to he was manifest in the flesh. He who? No. <laughs> we don't know. Luke 2.22. It says that Mary had a sacrifice for her. Because under the law, when she has a baby, she, they change it, the word to them in the critical text. So Jesus Christ needed a sacrifice for his sin when he was born? You tell me that doesn't affect doctrine? If my Savior is a sinner, then he did nothing for me. But if he's God manifest in the flesh who never sinned, then that's the only thing that could take me to heaven is him dying for me, the sinless one in my place. Uh, Matthew 5.22, the words without a cause are taken out of many new versions of the Bible. It says that Jesus said, don't get angry without a cause. Well, there's another verse in Mark 3.5 where it says, and he looked upon them in anger. Do you know there's a right kind of anger? It's called righteous indignation. But if you have a new version of the Bible, Jesus got angry. Now he's going to hell. Because it says if you get angry, and then you're in danger of hellfire. No, it says without a cause. Jesus had a cause. The Pharisees were in there doing bad stuff. So yes, new versions affect doctrine. That's why we believe in the King James only. Some people say well, the King James Bible is harder to read. Actually, no. No, she did what's called the Fleshman Kincaid test and found the King James Bible is between a 6th grade and 8th grade reading level. That's level. Right. New versions are ninth to 12th grade. <laughs> and new versions leave out whole verses and things like that. Pick up one of these, please, before you go. And this gives you some uh, verses where things are omitted and shows you where the new versions have some problems. So we have here the true church, all right? And we have here the not true doctrine. And I've got to finish up here. But let me read you a quote of a man who was in the um, Reformation. And here's what he said in 1602. Spaniard that said this in 1602. This is just this sums it up so well. Because it is not right to conform the certain with the uncertain. The King James Bible is certain. I know this is the pure word from the right text. The uncertain would be this version right here. This is the one that says it's uncertain if this is the true text. This is the critical text. This is the certain. And it says, his, his uh, saying is this. Because it is not right to conform the certain with the uncertain, the word of God with the word of men. Do you want God's words or do you want man changing God's word and saying, well, I think it ought to say this. I again plead to our good, merciful God and Father that he give you grace to hear him and to know his will and that knowing it, you will conform to it. And so be saved through the blood of the lamb whoo, without blemish that sacrificed himself on the altar of the cross to forgive our sins before God. Amen. Amen. It's all about the blood, isn't it? Unless you have a different version in Colossians 1.14. Do you have a different Bible? Go to Colossians 1.14 and see if it says through his blood. It won't. They took the blood out. Why are they taking out the blood of Jesus out of the Bibles? I'm going to stick with the King James where the truth is. I'm not going to go to these new versions. I call them what they are, perversions. And I'm not attacking. The people say, well, it's my preference. Well, make sure your preference is based on fact because your Bible's missing. Did you know the NIV? 
There were two homosexuals that helped translate the NIV. One of them was a lesbian woman named Mollenkot. And she took out the word sodomite out of the Bible. I guess it offended her. She put in male temple prostitute, whatever that is. <laughs> um, did you know the, the NIV is, is like 60,000 words less than our King James Bible? Did you know all these things? Why not? You go into a bookstore and you go, which Bible? They go, oh, just pick one. I, I recommend the NASB, all right? They don't show you where the verses are changed. And so that's, that's kind of sad. I'll close with this. This is the words of this Allen guy. He is a modern Bible scholar. Here's what he says. How firmly the Texas Receptus was entrenched in these areas is shown by the fact that the British and Foreign Bible Society, then the largest and most influential of all the Bible societies, continued to distribute it officially for fully 20 years after the publication of the Westcott and Hort edition. It was not until 1904 that they adopted the Nestle text, which then was in its fifth edition. See, it's always changing. This marked the final defeat of the Texas Receptus nearly 400 years after it was printed. They say we defeated the King James Bible. Yet we still use it, amen? Because we see it for what it is, the true Word of God. Voices have been raised recently in the United States claiming superiority for the Texas Receptus over modern editions of the text, but they are finding little favorable response outside of some limited circles. <laughs> I guess we're the limited circle because we chose not to follow what man says. We chose to look into it ourselves and go, no, that's, that's the true Word of God. I'm going with the KJV because all these new versions over here, guess what they are? They're the perverted Word of God. So they have changed. They're the corrupt. They're the Catholic critical text. So there it is. I hope that's a blessing to you. I'll leave up here real quick. We've got to get started for church and everything. But I wanted to, as quickly as possible, show you this. I don't know what we'll do next week. Maybe we'll talk more about inspiration, preservation. Maybe I'll just show you some examples of... Come up here real quick, brother. Maybe I'll just show you some examples of new versions. You know what I have in my hand here? I have what's called the Living Bible. Which text does it come from? Alexandrian text. It says it's for children. A children's living Bible. Would you, um, would you read that verse right there to us? Out loud? No, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Because yeah. what is it? Show, show his face. What does it say? <laughs> you want me to say that? No, I don't want you to say that. <laughs> That's in a so-called new version of the Bible. That's horrible. That's there you horrible. go. There you go. Let me, let me read it to you and clean it up. Saul boiled with rage, you SOB. Our King James Bible says, you son of a perverse woman. That's not bad. But to say, you SOB, is that teaching children how to cuss? That's supposed to be a child's Bible. <laughs> I'm just like, what? So you got you to gotta study this, folks. We're called dogmatic. We're, we're intolerant King James Bible believers. No, we, we just studied it. And we're like, no, I don't, I don't want those other versions. I don't want to teach my child to say SOB. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> and I don't want Bibles that are missing verses. I want the true word of God from the true text. Amen. All right. Thank you for the verse you said in Colossians. Colossians 114. Colossians 114. A question and Quick question. Yes, ma'am. Flip the board. Flip the board. Yes. I thought I heard you say that they translated it from the Latin Vulgate to the Latin. Okay. So they translated from these Greeks into Latin. And the Catholic Church is, in Rome has always used Latin, so the Latin Vulgate came from more of the Alexandrian text. And by the way, here's a map. Here's where God's Word came from, and it's on the right side of the map. Here's where the bad versions, and it's on the left. Is there, is there anything to that? I mean, today you see the, the right and then the left. I want to be right, don't you? <laughs> or you'll be left behind. Okay, sorry. Yes? Yeah, all other Bibles are copyrighted. And so if you buy another Bible, do you know that so much of that money goes back to the Vatican? So if you're purchasing another Bible than the King James, you're actually supporting the Vatican in Rome. Did you know that? That's scary. <laughs> That's creepy. So the King James has, well, it's, there's a copyright in the King James, but it's not a copyright because it's copyright, but yet it's free for anyone to print without paying any royalties. All public domain. All new versions, you have to pay royalties to them if you print it. Why don't we print the free Word of God? The salvation's free and God's Word is free. But no. Is uh, sometimes there's a topic, copywriting and things like that. Do you have a quick question, brother? Yeah, on the other side of your board. Yes, sir. So the line goes to 
to reformers and then back to the false yes. church, that would be representing the new apostolic reformation? Ex ecumenicalism, and you're right, there's what's called the New Apostolic Reformation, which is kind of ecumenical, which is all about, hey, let's get back to Rome, they're not that bad. But we've seen that they are the branch of the, the bad. So why would we get in with them? Let's stick over here with the true church and the true Bible. Because many of them are the false church with the false Bible. And that's why they're so quick to get rid of doctrine. Because it's not important to them. And the Bible says that this is where our doctrine comes from. So I'm King James only. And you know what? I'm not a fanatic, am I? I'm just a level-headed dude that studied out and goes, yeah, that looks like the right one to me. So will you be one of those limited circles? Like they say, we're the, we're the limited circles of people that believe the truth. Well, apostasy, the majority falls away. And only a few have the truth. Let's stick with the King James Bible. Amen? Amen. Anybody else? All right, let's get going. And... Uh, Ray or somebody, if you can help me, I got a lot of stuff to pack up, so we, I parked right there. So, Amen. Thank you for watching. Next week, I can't wait to see what we study. So, appreciate it. Amen.